Uh, let's talk to Will Geddes, the security expert, about this. I mean, it's really mystifying, but so horrifying. I think people just cannot believe or conceive of an adult man wielding a knife, stabbing a baby in a pram. It's just unthinkable. So I don't know what, if anything, we can begin to conclude about this man with no psychiatric record, who is a Christian, who has been given asylum in, in, in uh, Sweden. So what, what can we even begin to piece together? Well, I mean, that's the, the, the biggest challenge, Vanessa. I mean, yes. in any of these kind of instances, unless they're very, very, you know, public and very, you know, obvious and overt about what their agenda mm -hmm. is, and especially when something like this happens in a very quiet, sleepy little town, you know, you expect something like this to happen in a busy metropolis, you know, it could be in Paris, Marseille, uh, even in Nice for that matter, but to happen in this tiny, quiet, sleepy town, mm -hmm. uh, this sends reverberations through the general public, mm -hmm. obviously in terms of concerns about the spontaneity of this kind of attack. Now, inevitably, what the authorities are going to be doing, even though they have been very, very quick, and this is something that we've seen, certainly with the authorities around the world, that in the wake of any of these types of incidents, what they will do is they will get as much information out as quickly as possible to combat any disinformation or misinformation that is in, being propagated across social media, because right. that's the constant challenge. But the authorities are going to be digging very, very deep into this individual, his background, his reasons for being in France, you know, as we've, we've, we've noted, and certainly Holly just mentioned, he was seeking asylum in France. And one of the biggest concerns this again highlights, particularly within the anti-terrorism, and this is not believed to be terrorism in any shape or form, mm -hmm. is the fact that you've got individuals that are getting in via what we would call soft or least resistant entry points, like Sweden, mm. and then subsequently wanted to move on to the continent or go to another country. So why he hasn't uh, actually requested asylum in Sweden and is requesting it for France, again, is another part of the jigsaw piece. Well, it seems as if he, he, he was granted it in Sweden, lived there for 10 years, yeah. now has had it refused in France. But that doesn't really put any of this jigsaw together in any kind of way that we can no. understand. It's also been said, I'm not sure if it's absolutely confirmed, that he's a father of a toddler himself. Indeed, of a similar age of to one of the children that's been age. injured, yes. So that would make you begin to speculate, and this is pure speculation yes. on my part, yeah. I'm not doing anything but speculating, you might want wonder if he might be a man, for example, whose relationship has broken up, who has not been granted access to his own toddler, whether it might be something like that. So a kind of psychological alienation, a kind of grief and revenge or something of that kind, possibly. I think that's a very intuitive assessment. I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, I've seen similar cases in the past that parallel uh, those kind of situations where emotionally there has been some breakdown in the individual. However, uh, to actually manifest into an attack of this cowardly level mm -hmm. and against so many other children and total strangers yeah. uh, really defies any kind of logic. So there have got to be, I mean, certainly the authorities will learn an awful lot by basically interrogating or interviewing this individual to try and break down what was his motive? Yeah. Why was he particularly doing it? And why in this particular location? The other thing I wanted to ask you was about the testimony of that man who was a witness yeah. saying, you know, the police were so slow. I was shouting at him, he said. I was shouting, shoot him, shoot him. And while I was shouting, the man stabbed the adult twice while this man was watching him doing it. Now, I just wondered, I mean, you're so experienced in these matters, I wondered whether it's one of those occasions where time freezes and you think the police are being slow because everything sort of goes into slow motion because it's so incredibly shocking, but actually the police are moving fast, or whether we think that this testimony was accurate and somehow or other the French police were wading through treacle to get to the point where they, were, you know, because <coughs> it's a big deal to shoot yeah. someone in the legs, obviously, oh, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. So, so, so I, I, I wonder what you thought, you're so used yeah. to people talking in shock after these sorts of things, I thought you might have some Insight into well, it. I mean, certainly I would say I believe that the eyewitness, and I think, you know, it's probably not entirely unacceptable that the, the gendarme in this instance mm. probably didn't react as dynamically and as quickly as one would like to hope. And I think a lot of that, again, is borne by the location. I yeah. mean, these are uh, a gendarme which are in a small, sleepy town. You know, the, the, the number of incidents which they would be required to get involved in, the number of situations that have given them built that experience. Whereas, for example, if you're in Paris, you're dealing with aggression and violence on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. 
these guys were probably still trying to assess and work out what was going on. The one thing I am really thankful for is the fact that they, it wasn't a fatal shooting mm -hmm. by the gendarme, that it was obviously to immobilise him and they shot him in the legs, yeah. which obviously leaves us with an individual that can then be interviewed and interrogated for what were his motives. And give some kind of yeah. explanation, we hope. All right.